start by acknowledging that this meeting is being held uh, over the internet, but within Squamish Nation territory. Um, we've done our roll call. I will, uh, firstly write, read out the procedures for electronic meetings, as is the, uh, custom. Um, customers attending, committee members attending the meeting electronically are required to advise the chair of the meeting of the following circumstances. When the committee member disconnects or reconnects, enters or exits the meeting, so that this can be recorded in the minutes of the meeting. B, committee members are to identify themselves when they advise the chair that they wish to be placed on the speaker's list. D, with respect to a vote, committee members are only required to state a nay vote. No statement required if the member is in favor. Uh, item D is committee members shall put the telephone or computer on mute unless they wish to speak. E, committee members shall be involved in and participate in the meeting. F, committee members shall text the CAO or appropriate person if there is difficulty with their telephone or computer, and that would be yourself, Jonas? That's right. And can we g give a number? Yeah, why don't I that everyone it? reports it? Okay, very good. The number will be in the chat for this. Uh, and the last item is the meeting shall be recessed for up to 10 minutes if a technical difficulty occurs on the district side, which results in the committee member being unable to connect to the meeting. So that's, um, that's the rules of the game. Uh, first item up is the adoption of the agenda. Can I have someone to move on that? Jackie, second, David, uh, anyone against? Nope, okay, and then we move on to uh, minutes from the previous meeting, which was May 21st, 2020. Uh, any comments from anyone on uh, reviewing those minutes? No comments, can I have uh, someone move for adopting them? David, second by Sarah, anyone against? No problem there. And the first item of business is Waterfront Landing Phase 3B, 3C, DP application. And we'll hand over to uh, uh, Susan or Jonas. Yep. Yes, thank you. I will run the presentation uh, uh, from this computer and Susan will uh, narrate it. Susan, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Can you center the slides, Jonas? And I don't know why it's coming, uh, didn't seem to be centered on the screen. How's that? Uh, that's a little better. I think that's the best I can do. Okay. I don't know if there's a full page setting there, but um, anyway, that that should work. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Susan Stratus. I'm a planner working with the district. I've been working on the waterfront landing project through its first couple of phases. And uh, today we're looking at the third phase with two apartment buildings. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just very quickly, uh, the site we're looking at has a legal address on Highway 99. It was a previous industrial site. Uh, the access is from Highway 99. I think uh, you've probably noticed the new intersection there at Clark Drive. And the phase one and two townhouses are now under construction. Next slide, please. So the um, property that we're looking at today, 3B and 3C, are at the north end of the site, colored in red. And uh, this is more or less following the phasing plan that was adopted in 2017. Um, the applicants have jumped ahead to 3B and 3C, 
and we'll be completing phase 3A, I believe, directly afterwards. So the first DP for 88 units was issued in 2017, and the second DP for 134 townhouse units was issued in 2018. Those are the areas circled in blue. Next slide, please. The policy framework for waterfront landing, there is a sub-area plan adopted that has its own DPA 13 guidelines that are similar but also somewhat different from the DPA 3 guidelines that the design panel usually works with. The DPA 13 guidelines have two components that apply, the general design and site planning portion and residential and mixed-use guidelines. The zoning for the property is CD40, and these two are the single parcel is on mixed-use commercial that allows for a mix of ground floor commercial and upper story residential use. Next slide, please. In addition to the zoning and DP guidelines, there is a land development agreement in place, an LDA, and that requires 55 non-market units, 50 market rental units, and the application in front of us has exceeded those requirements by providing an additional 90 market rentals. The affordable rentals or non-market rentals are required to have a minimum 70 square meter average size, and that was put in place to make sure that there were some two- and three-bedroom family size units included. There is a 1,200 square meter minimum commercial space requirement for each of these buildings, which has been met. A daycare has been provided that somewhat exceeds the minimum requirement in the LDA, and one of the other conditions was that public parking, eight spaces, be provided for Waterfront Park, and that's also being provided. Next slide, please. Just looking quickly at the types of units proposed in the two buildings, so Building 3B is the one that provides both the market and non-market 105 rental units, shown in blue, and you'll see that those extend into the two- and three-bedroom units. Building 3C, which is the additional market rentals proposed, is focused more on one-, two-bedroom and bachelor units, shown in green. There's also 40 adaptable units provided. The zoning required 28 adaptable units. Fifteen accessible units are provided, and 11 of those units were required. Next slide, please. There is a request for a relatively minor parking variance. The apartment building has a deficiency of 37 spaces under the current zoning bylaw standards. The commercial use has a surplus of 14 spaces, and the Waterfront Park has been met. So overall, we're seeing a deficiency of 23 spaces, parking spaces. The applicants did provide a parking study that indicated that the shared commercial and residential uses and the proposed lower ratio for affordable housing would address this parking deficiency, and staff generally support this approach. There is a lot of parking provided in this development overall. Next slide, please. So we're looking for ADP recommendations, I guess, first of all, on the overall form and character of the Phase 3B and C apartments. These are, you know, quite a different building form than we've looked at for the townhouses in the first development. There is a proposed building height variance, in part because the buildings have a pitched roof on them. So the building height variance is not huge. They're requesting an increase from 25 to 26.16 meters for Building 3B, 
and 25.86 meters for building 3C. And the parking I've already mentioned. The next slide, please. So that uh, is the end of our presentation, and I will turn it over to the applicant's project team for the rest of the slides. Great, thanks, Susan. Can uh, everyone hear me? Okay. Wonderful. Um, Mark, sorry, I was just going to do a brief intro on, on our part. Okay, you bet. Um, so yeah, I thank Susan for the um, the introduction to uh, to our project, uh, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brendan Yee with uh, Boza Properties. I'm the uh, director of development for this project. Um, just to quickly introduce our team here, we've got uh, Mark Lockwood um, and Steve Akers with the Kitsix Architecture, um, who we'll hand the presentation off to next, um, and then Mike Enns from uh, Enns and Gautier Landscape Architecture. Um, so today we're pretty excited to be uh, presenting our first two mid-rise buildings uh, within the master plan. Um, just to, to build on what Susan said, said and presented a little bit and to put our site in context, um, the Sea and Sky is a master plan community. Um, it sits on about 55 acres um, and we'll have an ultimate build out of around 1,100 units. Um, to date, we've been working on the master plan for about five years. Um, and we've recently hit some great milestones with the opening of uh, the Clark Drive overpass and uh, Laurel Wood Road, um, two major pieces of infrastructure that we uh, really needed to complete in order for the community to uh, start functioning properly. Um, it was great to get these completed. Um, and, and if you haven't already, I would uh, strongly encourage using the new overpass and, uh, and taking a drive through our first phase. Um, so phase one consisted of, of 88 townhome units, um, and it's in the process of completion. We've got uh, about half of those units currently occupied with uh, happy homeowners we hear, and, uh, and the remainder becoming occupied over the remainder of this summer. Um, phase two is, uh, consists of 134 townhomes um, and started construction in March, um, and that'll span over the next two years. Um, so phase three B and C was um, originally planned to be a mixture of, of non-market rental, uh, market rental and stratified condo units. Um, and I think after some internal discussion with our ownership group, we, we really felt like the best product um, to complement the current community um, would be replacing the condo units um, with more rental. Um, we, we thought this would help uh, increase the, the supply of much needed rental product in Squamish. Um, and, and really just help grow the community in, in general um, and, and also demonstrate our long-term commitment and, and ownership to the community and, and to this master plan, which we are, uh, which we're quite proud of. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, the architecture team and uh, we're looking forward to, to the feedback and discussion afterwards. Thank you. Great, thanks, Brenda. Um, so are, are we able to pull up the first slide of the presentation? Yes, it should be up. Uh, can you not see it? I'm seeing a blue screen. How about now? Yeah. No, nothing yet. blue screen at my end.
still blue. Unfortunately, All right, we're looking good, I think. Oh, I can see it. Yeah, okay. uh, it's all good now. Let's keep rolling then. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Uh, again, I'm uh, Mark Lockwood from Acoustics Architecture. And uh, thank you very much, Susan, uh, for the introduction. You were able to kind of cover a lot of the uh, kind of high level uh, project statistics, which was great. Um, so, uh, to Piggyback a little bit off of uh, what Brendan was, uh, was speaking about. Uh, this project is an extension of uh, kind of a larger master plan community. And from an architectural perspective and from a community perspective, uh, waterfront landing is, uh, is creating quite a bold statement um, kind of just on the other side of downtown uh, and across the Manquan Channel. And I think that's evidence in the existing townhomes and the sales center that's currently on the site. Uh, where it is kind of a very kind of unique uh, brand and bold statement uh, of, uh, of architecture, high quality materials, and uh, uh, an architectural style that kind of references the, uh, the, you know, the industrial kind of waterfront nature uh, of the site. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the vision, and I think I spoke about it a little bit already, is uh, waterfront landing as a whole is meant to create a, uh, you know, a vibrant mixed-use community. So townhomes, apartments, mixed-use buildings, um, you know, some recreational uses down by the waterfront and the marina, and kind of a pedestrian network that's kind of interconnected. And the overall master plan anticipates uh, a lot of kind of looping pedestrian connections uh, throughout the site. Uh, which creates
creates a sense of community and uh, also as we're developing this community, creating a distinct uh, architectural uh, brand and identity to the community as well. Um, and I think, you know, the vision for the site also, uh, you know, uh, you know, seeks to sort of hit um, a commitment to sustainability and sort of better uh, environmental performance for a uh, for residential mixed use development. Um, next slide, please. And we can probably um, pass over the land use one. I think Susan already covered that one, uh, Jonas. The next slide. So in terms of uh, in terms of context, um, so we have north to the right of the uh, of the site plan, and that will be sort of waterfront landing park. Um, to the lower or the, the east side of the site, uh, we have Laurelwood Road, which is existing uh, and recently constructed with a uh, cul-de-sac at the end. And uh, at the end of that cul-de-sac, in the long term, there'll be a, a future bridge connection. Uh, which takes traffic across uh, into downtown as well. Um, to the south, we have uh, a Road B, and uh, to the west, we have the Phase 3A townhomes, um, uh, which are actually currently under, uh, under design as well, and sort of part of our overall uh, master planning consideration for this site. Um, phase 3 and uh, 3C, um, are essentially two uh, six-story mixed-use uh, apartment buildings, uh, a mix of market rental and affordable rental, um, as, uh, as Susan mentioned. And basically, uh, these two buildings are centered around a, uh, a central plaza, uh, which, um, as we get into the landscape discussion, uh, Mike will further elaborate on. Um, because of the flood construction levels, um, the parkade for the development is is uh, slightly raised above the uh, above the existing grade. So the the, um, the two apartment buildings themselves are situated on top of a, um, a raised parking podium, and off of uh, off of Road B to the uh, to the left of the screen, uh, there's essentially two um, access points uh, into the site. Uh, the first one is the access point into underground parking, and then the second is a uh, is a, a road or lane uh, that brings you up on top of the uh, parking podium to the surface uh, commercial parking and uh, residential visitor parking uh, that you see in the site plan here. And along Laurelwood, you uh, you see the layby. And uh, because Laurelwood, uh, it was uh, desired by engineering and planning not to have any um, kind of direct access into the site off of Laurelwood, uh, we are proposing just a, uh, a lay-by for sort of services and garbage pickup uh, to keep some of that, uh, you know, back of house uh, uh, use, if, uh, if you will, kind of away from the more kind of prominent uh, sort of fronting um, side of the building, which would be kind of more to the top of the screen, uh, fronting on to the, uh, 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 to the parking. Um, next slide, please. From a diagrammatic point of view, we have a series of, um, you know, pedestrian connectivity paths happening. Uh, one being uh, sort of the, you know, running north-south or from right to left on the page would be the more bold uh, orange and dotted red line, which is the continuation of the uh, of the pedestrian and multi-use loop that um, basically you know circumferences the entire waterfront landing development. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the path network connects into the phase one townhome development to the left, and then continues uh, uh, through the site, uh, kind of bordering the property line between three B and three C. Uh, and the, uh, the phase 3A townhomes to the top of the page and connect straight through to the, uh, uh, the waterfront landing park. And then uh, kind of running up and down the page uh, in the same kind of bold tone, uh, uh, orange and dotted red, is the intent that the, the main plaza between the building has a strong linkage and pedestrian connection to the, uh, 
uh, the internal uh, part that's going to be happening in uh, phase 3A, the strata park. And so we're kind of anticipating that this plaza and commercial area will be kind of a hub and a destination for not only this site, but the, uh, uh, but the broader community. Um, you can see in the dotted, just the plain uh, dotted yellow lines, uh, the pedestrian connections along the existing, um, I guess, district sidewalks. And then in red, uh, you can see the circulation around the buildings, um, you know, giving access into the, um, the commercial retail units. And then the larger red arrows indicate the, uh, the access to the, uh, the residential lobby and elevator. Um, you'll also see in the green kind of uh, some of the major access points uh, off of the corner of Laurelwood and Road B, and then uh, off of the uh, off of the access uh, access road uh, around the Pocket Plaza. And we're going to uh, have another slide which I'll actually talks more about the um, the accessibility circulation through the site as well later on in the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So from an architectural perspective, um, as I mentioned, we wanted to take clues from what's being established at uh, Waterfront Landing already and uh, create a, you know, with 3B and 3C, create a unified architectural character. And I think what's being defined at Waterfront Landing is an architecture of uh, kind of bold building form, um, like the existing sales center, which is the uh, which is the image at the, in the middle, uh, uh, at the bottom image in the middle, and uh, you know creates sort of this reference to kind of you know um, warehouse kind of waterfront buildings, uh, sort of referencing maybe Northern European, Scandinavian type architecture that you know has a real clarity in the architectural form, but a patterning of kind of windows and balconies that create scale and articulation to the building facades. So. Um, you know, so there's sort of a sort of a human scaled element to the elevations, and then use um, you know combination of natural toned materials and kind of more uh, a more contemporary uh, palette of of grays to sort of contrast against it. So we end up with this very much kind of a West Coast kind of color palette uh, that would uh, uh, very much fit into the uh, kind of the Squamish environment. Uh, next slide, please. From an architectural perspective at the ground plane and the commercial uh, kind of highlighting, uh, you know, extensive use of glazing, uh, storefront glazing, large overhangs so the pedestrian experience that grade is that of a kind of a covered protected walkway as you're kind of walking along the, uh, uh, the edge of the, uh, of the retail units. And then also using the retail to create a base for the building so the building's very much, uh, very much grounded to the site. Next slide, please. So the first image here um, highlights uh, 3B, uh, which as Susan mentioned is the uh, combination building of non-market and uh, market rental suites, uh, 105 units. Uh, it's the longer of the two buildings and uh, what we look to do uh, architecturally is to, is to break up the building mass by using the series of um, offset gable frames, which kind of breaks the building down into essentially three elements. Um, so again, the building is meant to have a strong architectural form, but broken down into, uh, into a manageable scale. And then layered on top of that is the patterning of punched windows and balconies, which creates the, uh, um, the building articulation. And then in between those offset gables, we have kind of the, you know, the warmer uh, wood tone materials, uh, which breaks the offset gables apart, but also defines, uh, so for example, where the, uh, the residential entry is um, for the building. Next slide, please. And then just at a slightly larger scale, uh, just sort of seeing a bit closer the material palette where we're combining kind of the darker grays, which are kind of the fiber cement panels, um, a language of horizontal shiplap siding, uh, which gives us a nice kind of clean contemporary facade where we can do punched opening uh, kind of minimal frames around the windows to give it that contemporary look. 
and then contrast that with the punching out of the uh, of the glass uh, glass guard balconies, uh, giving the sweep each uh, kind of um, outdoor space, and then worth noting kind of all the soffit materials for those bal uh, balconies as well are, are in a wood tone material. So certainly from the ground plane looking up, your your appreciation of kind of the warmer tone materials will will be uh, even more e uh, evident. And then you can also see in the break uh, where the wood tone material kind of bisects the two offset gables at the, at the ground, the uh, the entrance to the uh, to the residential unit, uh, 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 the residential lobby, I should say. And uh, this image probably shows also just sort of the you know the metal and glass canopy that's going to be um, you know at the base of the building, creating that covered walkway for the retail unit. Next slide, please. So 3C takes a uh, takes a similar approach. This is the uh, the all market building with 90 suites, uh, market rental that is, and it also has uh, the retail upgrade and uh, also the daycare space, which is uh, which is adjacent, which is the unit adjacent to the uh, waterfront park. Um, a shorter building, so this one is broken down up into two offset gables, and uh, the break in between the gable. Uh, the offset gables define that uh, entry to the residential lobby. And the color palette for this one, if we if we go to the next slide, is somewhat of an inverse of uh, of the other building. So this one here showcases more the kind of the warmer wood tone shiplap siding, and uh, that's contrasted against the uh, you know the darker gray fiber cement panels. And to the bottom left of the image, you can see where the daycare um, has, a, has a spill out space to its uh, outdoor play area. Next slide, please. So just a, a bit of a closer look at the, um, at the two material palettes, um, you know, both kind of working in a similar architectural form, really playing with the field color of the uh, of the horizontal shiplap siding, one one being the light gray, um, the other being kind of the warmer toned uh, shiplap siding. Next slide, please. So this is the streetscape elevation from Laurelwood Road, and here you see um, you know combined uh, building. 3B on the left and building 3C to the right. And you can see the, you know, I think together uh, the buildings read very well together in terms of, um, you know, kind of having a, you know, the two buildings have a similar and unified building form, yet kind of a varied rhythm of uh, offset gables. Uh, so again, 3B has the building kind of broken down into a, you know, scale of three offset gables and then building C is broken down into two. And then obviously the material palette uh, gives, uh, gives the building some, uh, some differentiation as well. And uh, I think in this streetscape elevation, you can also see how those kind of gables come down to meet, they kind of wrap down the building wall to meet the commercial base um, and kind of the covered, uh, the covered walkway for the residential unit, uh, uh, for the commercial units rather. Next slide, please. So just very quickly at the ground floor, uh, uh, building 3B, uh, primarily made up of the, uh, of the commercial space. And this is just an indication of how, how the building could be broken up into sort of a finer scale of, uh, of, uh, of retail units or, uh, or could be occupied by a, by a single uh, uh, tenant potentially. Uh, so it has that flexibility. And then uh, kind of that kind of one-third point in the plan, uh, we have the residential entry and it, it lobby with uh, mail and elevators and uh, leasing office for the, uh, uh, for the rental units. Next slide, please. Uh, because 3B is the building that combines both the market and the non uh, and the non-market uh, uh, units, uh, this color coding shows uh, 
So the darker orange, and uh, you know, quite light, uh, so the darker orange is the non-market uh, residential units, and the lighter yellow is the, uh, is the market rental suite. So um, it's quite nice how the units are kind of mixed within a floor. There's no kind of segregation of different types on, uh, on different floors. And uh, because of the requirement for the average area for the non-market units to be 70 square meters, um, it actually works out that a lot of the non-market units are the larger kind of, you know, uh, you know, two and three bed units, corner units. So uh, I think there's a lot of value there um, for, you know, kind of that uh, non-market uh, segment. Uh, next slide, please. So just a typical site section, this one through 3B, uh, so you can see how the, um, how the parkade is uh, situated on the site. Uh, you have Laurel Wood to the left, and uh, you know, uh, Mike from EJLA will be speaking about kind of the, the edge of the parkade and how that's being handled and uh, trying to really sort of blend the parkade into the, uh, into the landscape slope. And then we have the commercial floor with five stories of, uh, of residential above. And then to the right, uh, you can see the, um, uh, the commercial and uh, residential visitor, uh, visitor parking um, on, the, uh, on top of the suspended slab. Next slide, please. So uh, the lower floor for building 3C, so this is right adjacent to the, uh, uh, the waterfront park, uh, which would be to the right of the screen, and uh, that kind of light green tone is, uh, is where the daycare is indicated, so it's at the prime location uh, right next to the, um, um, the waterfront park and, and spilling out to its uh, outdoor play area, as we saw in the rendering. And then the remainder of the ground floor is the uh, retail units. Um, these ones indicate opportunities for uh, mezzanine space for potentially a second floor office and, uh, and again, the lobby for the residential. Next slide, please. Um, so this building is all, all market rental, uh, so this is just the, uh, the typical floor plan for, uh, for each of the building floors and kind of you can sort of see the uh, the extent of the balconies as well for uh, for each of these units. Next slide, please. And then a typical site section through 3C, uh, again, a similar condition, and uh, just a wider uh, uh, section of the parkade where we have all of our, um, you know, residential uh, visitor parking and commercial parking on top, and then the property line, the red line to the right, uh, just beyond that, we would have uh, our interface to the uh, Phase 3A townhome, uh, which would be at that, uh, at that same grade as the parkade. So those would be two-story units uh, facing, the, um, uh, facing uh, Building 3C, and then they would negotiate the grade down, so they're, uh, they're three stories on the other side. Next slide, please. So this particular slide just demonstrates the housing diversity and sort of the range of unit types, uh, everything from studios to uh, three-bedroom suites, as I mentioned. So sort of a good mix, uh, hitting a lot of different uh, user needs and, uh, and price points as well. Next slide, please. Uh, as Susan mentioned, uh, there is a requirement for the uh, both adaptable and accessible uh, uh, units in the project, and we do exceed those requirements. And uh, this sheet uh, has a lot of information on it, so I won't go through it all, but it just sort of indicates how we're um, accommodating all of the um, adaptable and accessible uh, requirements for, uh, for units uh, you know, in, both, uh, in both buildings. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned uh, when talking about the pedestrian connectivity, this particular diagram really just uh, is aimed to demonstrate the accessible path through the site. Uh, so I guess sort of starting at the corner of Laurelwood and Road B, uh, we have a, uh, a ramp which brings you up to the uh, 
retail level, uh, just at the corner of building 3B there. And from there, you're essentially uh, you have a flat path of travel around the entire perimeter of building 3B, uh, bringing you to the central plaza, and then uh, flat uh, accessible routes on uh, both sides of 3C, and then connections you know, to the multi-use trail. And uh, the two circles in front of uh, 3B and 3C are, are kind of you know, public nodes uh, but also kind of the locations of uh, the accessible parking stalls as well. Next slide, please. So just a couple of detailed renderings. This one is at kind of the corner of Building 3B at the, uh, at the Central Plaza, uh, which I'll let uh, Mike talk about a little bit more. But again, just highlighting opportunities, large covered, uh, you know, uh, covered walking areas, uh, no opportunities for a spill out of the, uh, the commercial uses. Next slide. And then a uh, detailed rendering uh, just of one of the kind of typical residential entries which would bring you into the residential lobby. Uh, so again, using that break in between the offset gables to sort of define the access points into the, uh, into the residential lobby. Next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, the project is uh, aiming to kind of hit uh, appropriate sustainability targets, and uh, this one is uh, is slated to uh, meet step three of the code, and uh, you know also sort of looking at measures in terms of uh, you know site permeability and dealing with uh, uh, stormwater runoff will all be factors when we uh, when we kind of look at the um, you know, the more detailed uh, elements of the design. So, um, we're, you know, the, develop, uh, the developer BOSA is committed to, uh, you know, fulfilling those ob obligations. Next slide, please. And then just sort of the final slide from an architectural point of view, just a, a view to that central plaza uh, between uh, buildings 3B and 3C, which create this kind of social heart and, uh, to create a nice break in between the two buildings. Um, so maybe with that, I'll hand it over to Mike and he can talk about the landscape scope of the project. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, all good. All right, everybody. Uh, hey, yeah, it's Mike Kent here. Uh, thanks for having us. I'm a landscape architect. Um, and I'll just go through um, uh, we've got about 10 slides here, so I, I won't take too long and open it up for comments and questions. So maybe just go forward to uh, our first slide for landscape. Um, so Mark touched on some of these, and it's just kind of a recap of some of the, the key design thematics that drive our, our design from the public realm uh, perspective. So the first top left corner, I'll just go left and then down, but um, you know, looking at we were trying to incorporate and be inspired by some of the, the regional icons, the rainforest, the mountains, the water, the chiefs, and bring some of that materiality to our the pedestrian scale design. Um, connectivity, Mark talked about this. We was really important to, to promote a, a site that's very physically permeable and visually permeable from the perimeters into the site. We're using materials um, you know, lots of boulders on the site, so uh, wherever we can utilize uh, local materials in our design. Um, you can just scroll up just a tad. I can, I don't know if everyone can see some of these words, but um, anyway, naturalized or natural, um, yeah, there you go. Natural materials in play for the potential playground area. Um, Mark talked a little bit about how we're trying to uh, integrate some. Um, public nodes and gathering spaces and perhaps for events in Canada Day or something like that and in some of the in and around the retail areas. And also to um, really maximize the site permeability from a rainwater perspective and minimize runoff and really try to create some absorptive landscapes. Next slide, please. So I won't get into too much detail on the master plan, but or the, the landscape master plan, but really um, from a, a programmatic um, 
perspective, and I'll just highlight some of the components of the public realm. So number one there is the central plaza space, as Mark talked about. We, we kind of dive in a little bit more detail further on, but um, number two on the south edge, um, you have a little pocket plaza adjacent to the retail. Um, three, all the way to the north side of the site is the potential playground area. Um, four and five are the um, retail perimeter pathways as, as well as the entry staircase at the south uh, east corner of the site at Laurelwood uh, Road and Road B. Um, and then five and six are the perimeter um, pathways, uh, again, as I mentioned, against the building and also uh, easy movement in and around the parking lot, um, as well as movement from the central plaza west to phase 3A and the community park there. Um, and, and seven would be a similar treatment to what we've seen in other phases on an off-site treatment, which is large shade trees and, and boulevard treatment. The next slide, please. Um, from a planting approach, um, our first step is to strategize and create a, a sort of a, a typology or, or a kind of a strategic treatment of, of, of what we're proposing in what areas. So in a general sense, um, in the areas that are highly visible, the entries and the, the public plazas and the nodes, that's where we integrate a little bit more perennial planting, a little bit more texture, a little bit more color, and kind of gives that wow factor. Um, but we do realize this is a, you know, it can be a harsh climate at times, especially in the winter. So for the most part, um, you know, the perimeter of the site, dealing with the transition up to our site in the parkade or the, the parking lot, we want to uh, integrate more uh, evergreen planting of varying in size, lots of hardy plants, lots of native shrubs, drought tolerant shrubs to, to minimize water um, demand. Um, where we can, we're going to try to incorporate rain gardens um, at the base of walls as well as within the, in the, the parking lot itself. And, um, and the boulevard treatment is, is fairly standardized, as I mentioned. It, it's a, a sod boulevard with, with uh, street trees that align with the overall master plan approach. Uh, next slide, please. This is our preliminary plant list. Um, generally, uh, the trees are, you know, we, we'd like to have a, um, a, a strong um, uh, uh, aspect of conifers at different sizes, um, fast growing trees, especially, and trees that can, are hardy and, and um, uh, uh, adjusted for that type of climate. The, the middle two rows, we really want to emphasize the evergreen component. Um, because they think in a, in a climate like this, it's more about texture and, and, and the presence of, of green as opposed to colors and flowers and stuff. But as I said, we are promoting uh, or proposing some uh, key areas where we would, um, you know, accentuate uh, with perennials and grasses and, and a little bit more color. Um, uh, next slide, please. Central Plaza, um, in response to the, the fact that it's surrounded by the CRU as well as to the east, um, we want to connect it to the community park. It's, it's sort of designed as, as, a, as a somewhat uh, uh, flexible um, gathering space. Um, we've got a stage there, number one, for potential events, some fixed seating underneath the shade trees as well as some movable seating. Uh, some feature paving and, uh, and possibly um, some public art or a mural or something like that um, against the uh, expansive wall for the elevator overrun. Um, but this is essentially the social heart of the site, so we want to make it uh, flexible enough to take a lot of people and uh, respond to the activities that are spilling out from the surrounding CRUs. Next slide, please. This is the south side of the site, so as you, you see the, on the bottom part of the, the plan, you see the entry stairs, so a little bit more of a feature, possible feature wall, a terrace um, 
stepping up with a ramp uh, to that feature corner on Laurelwood and, uh, and Road B. And as you wrap around on Road B, you look to your right and you see uh, the Pocket Plaza, which is a highly visible commercial retail activity zone uh, for people that are visiting or shopping or want to hang out for a little bit um, with uh, possible games or lounge area and outdoor seating with, with some shade trees overhead. Next slide, please. Some of those images sort of give you an idea of what we're thinking pro programmatically. Um, we've talked a lot about connectivity and, and um, I think this is a, a cross section of the, of the multi-use pathway that connects the larger master plan waterfront landing site. And I think the idea is just to really make it easy for people to move around of all different ages and abilities on this. So the section is, um, you can see the property line where 3A and 3B, but um, um, it's, it's away from the, the parkade. So there would be some depth for, for trees and for shrubs. Next slide, please. Just a couple examples of our general approach to site perimeter treatment. Uh, B is uh, Laurel Wood, where the ramp is. And essentially, um, our approach is going to be um, more of uh, terracing with um, natural boulders that we can, and they would be carefully selected, but boulders that would work sort of single row boulders and then a terrace of planting and then another row and perhaps another terrace. But the idea is to really promote that, that regional icon of the chief and really select some really uh, large and, and monolithic boulders as much as we can um, to just kind of give that wow factor, particularly at the southeast corner and the south edge of the site where I think a, a large boulders would be a, a fantastic reference to the, the, the big chief that, that's um, looking over the site. Um, the, the one on the bottom is a section of uh, road B and uh, you can see the, the pocket plaza up on our site and then down at the bottom of the wall, you can see a little rain garden. So that would be our, where we have the room, we try to get a rain garden along there that we could um, run some of the, the water coming off the, the site and down the wall and into the rain garden. Next slide, please. Just a quick slide um, of not all of our of our materials, but some of the uh, furnishing and, and materials that have been used successfully in phase one. I think Bosa really likes the palette, um, and I think it's applicable to what we're doing as well as applicable to the architectural materials. Um, we are proposing sort of a feature um, uh, planter in the plaza. We realize we don't have a lot of depth, so I think um, we're going to play around with this and and um, probably step it down. You can see a number two there, sort of a, a wood top seating, and perhaps these are larger than what we're showing, but, but really giving the roof all for these shade trees uh, a lot of room to grow as well as, as sort of transitioning down to the future paving. Um, next slide, please. From a lighting perspective, it's really trying to create a safe, welcoming, um, intuitive site to move around, whether it's during the day or at nighttime. Um, in general, you know, the plazas, the stairways, the pathways, they'll all be illuminated. Maybe um, there's some opportunities for some feature lighting in the plazas, perhaps some LED strip lighting underneath the seating and some of the tree up lights. Um, but really just, um, uh, make it really easy to move around and where there's, where it makes sense to highlight uh, an, a landscape feature or an element, then we'll, we'll try to do that as well. And I think that's it. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. I'll, uh start with some questions at this point from the panel. I think I'll begin with uh, Christina today. You're ready? Yes, hi. I don't have a lot of questions. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I was just curious about the, uh, the multi-use trail. So that's way, way back. Can everybody hear me okay? I didn't. Yes. 
Yeah, okay. Um, in one of the slides um, where you were talking about the uh, pedestrian circulation, um, is the multi-use trail along a roadside? Is it a sidewalk? Is it like a valley trail that we have in Whistler? Uh, I'm just curious about whether it's actually a sidewalk. Is there a grade separation? So it is a uh, it is a wider uh, a wider trail meant to sort of accommodate both pedestrians and cyclists, and uh, it it kind of changes. Sometimes it's uh, you know a little bit roadside. Sometimes it's buried uh, you know within uh, within uh, development phases itself. So it does kind of meander in and out. So it's, it it has the varying conditions, but okay. it is meant to be this kind of very much a public loop uh, around the site. Okay. Um, and then the other question was, um, are you able to access the pocket park from a ramp? It looks like you can really just get there by stairs, or do you, is there a way to get up to that level um, with a stroller or in a wheelchair? I couldn't really tell. To the pocket park area? Which, uh, which pocket park are you referring to? The central one between the two buildings? No, I, think you, I think it's the retail one, um, Mark. Um, okay. I, if I can just add, I, I believe uh, for that one, there's a ramp on the on the southeast corner, and then, or you can come around and 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 come up the, I guess, the drive aisle or the sidewalk, I should say, and then you loop around. I don't know if we can put the plan up there, but um, I think that's is that. Do I have that right, Mark? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, I was just having a hard time sort of following that one around. So you would come up. Yes, I can see it. So you would come up the ramp on um, on Laurelwood, and then you sort of get on the side of the building, and then work your way around the building. Is that? Yeah, that, and or you come up through the parking lot and find your way uh, along the retail. Um, uh, pathway. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. That's good for me. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Christina. Barzin, ready for questions? Yes, hi. Um, thank you for presentation. Um, I see that lots of efforts have gone through for the site plan. Uh, but uh, I, I didn't see any relationship between this phase one and two and this building. I had this small little one that I could see. Is there any architectural relationship between the proposed building and the previous phases? Yeah, very much so. Um, so phase one and phase two, the, the architectural language is really all about these very kind of strong um, gable forms. And uh, we also, uh, but we wanted to also create a, a bit of a unique, uh, unique identity for this particular site as well. So uh, the roof form on the apartment buildings have gone for, again, a strong gable, but it's more of an offset kind of gable language. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at kind of the roof lines and how they wrap down the side, that's very much an architectural language that's evidence in the, uh, in the phase, one, uh, uh, phase one townhomes. Because I was not there, I don't know what the shape is. I, I was wish there was a picture or something from the phase one so I could see. But I don't know what what it looked like. But anyway, I, I was sort of interested to see the actual buildings because there is no side elevation, uh, there is no roof elevation. Even the section, the top part is, is vague. It doesn't, it's not completed. I can't see how the top floor is going to look like. Uh, and I didn't see any side elevation or roof plan. Yeah, so it's probably, yeah, maybe in one of the pers uh, perspectives, and we don't have one that's straight on right. in this particular package, uh, but essentially the idea is... Elevation. The, uh, yeah, so the roof lines wrap down the side of the building. Do you have uh, a roof plan? Uh, uh, probably just in the perspectives, uh, Yona. The perspectives are at the lower level. Would this be helpful? No. That's not the roof plan. That's just 
just elevation again. You have maybe five or six elevations, maybe one from C, and then many from the plaza, but none from the side. Yeah, so on the on the ends of the building, then I think in this package, the uh, the perspectives are, are the only ones that are going to get as close is, uh, yeah, yeah, right there. So the roof line comes down and wraps down the uh, at the end of the building. Two is flat. How is it? Do you think these two slope roofs? Oh, uh, between the slope roof, it is flat. That's right. So we're using that flat zone in between the uh, in between the gables. So you know, any rooftop mechanical equipment or anything that uh, anything like that would be screened and uh, and not visible from the street. I see. Any, any lighting or signage detail? I saw you, but you didn't have any. I saw the awnings, but I didn't see any detail about the commercial area. Do you have any? Yeah, uh, so the idea is we have the awnings, and then above that on the uh, on the fiber cement siding, we, it, you have a bit of a blank canvas in a way to sort of locate um, um, the detail signage. Yeah. And the lighting? And then the lighting, the idea is that that would be sort of suspended below the uh, uh, the perimeter awnings. Right, yeah. and a combination a combination of kind of undermount and uh, and uh, and wall sconces. You don't have any pictures or any detail or any rendering or anything to show that, right? Yeah, we don't have that yet. That's something that's uh, that's still in development. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's my question. Thanks, Farzan. Uh, Carlos, are you ready? Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I guess I've got a couple of questions for the district. What was the rationale uh, in securing minimum unit sizes for the affordable rentals of 700 meters squared? Um, that was, uh, 70 meters. Sorry, 70 meters squared, yeah, so 700, you know, 700 odd square feet. Uh, I, I could respond to that. It's Susan Stratus here. Um, when we were going through the sub area plan process, council was concerned that um, they had been going through a housing needs assessment to determine what kind of affordable housing was needed in the community. And the results of that study showed that the um, a lot of the demand was from families, and because of that, uh, the district wanted to see some larger units in these buildings and not uh, have simply a supply of one bedroom unit. So that's the reasoning behind that minimum. Okay, and then um, are there set affordable housing rates now? Or, or what those units will be rented for? I'll leave that to Jonas to answer there. Yeah, we're just um, we're just finalizing those uh, now. We're working on kind of a template house agreement, um, but we have not uh, put it out there. Although I'm pretty sure our uh, our housing request for the affordable housing policy has some rates in there. But I, okay. I don't have it off the top of my head. Okay, and then the re the rental building that's proposed is that. Um, Will that be secured at rental in perpetuity with the housing agreement through the district? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, great. Uh, and then the last one, what's the, I noticed that there were a few eight, I think it was eight, maybe there were 16 um, tandem parking spaces proposed in the parkade. Uh, and I just was wondering what the district of Spanish current and the staff position is on those tandem parking stalls. Um, okay, uh, from the landscape side, was there any thought put towards um, wind mitigation 
uh, within the, the plaza between the two buildings, it, it's quasi south facing, and we just you know tend to get quite a bit of wind. There, so you can speak to any consideration that was done for that. Um, I, I don't know if we get the plan up. Do you mean on the um, on the Laurelwood side? Something like wind coming through there? Yeah, and I, so I guess if, if I'm understanding the site context correctly, it's kind of coming from the parking lot. Like south is, is a parking lot-ish. I guess you've got the plan north, but the actual north is a bit different than, than what's shown. Is that correct? Is what? Sorry, can you repeat that? Is your, is, like, is your north arrow correctly pointing north, or is it just like no. simplifies the plan? Uh, I think it's more or less correct. Okay. I think so, yeah. Uh, so, it, where are you thinking uh, from the, um, the, I guess, coming from the, the west? Yeah. Sorry. My... Yeah. I, I think that's something that, that we could certainly consider. I think um, generally, I think we're trying to get as many trees and vegetation as we can in the site. So, hopefully, that would mitigate it. But uh, we can certainly look at, you know, on a, on a, on a local aspect and, or a microclimate for each one of these public spaces. And consider that. So, absolutely. Whether it's screening or, um, you know, actual fencing or something like that, for sure. Um, okay, thank you. And then for the eight spaces that you need to provide for the park, are they designated as of yet on your plan? With their actual location? I can speak to that. Uh, yeah. So, right now, they're, uh, they're generally located. Um, I guess on this plan where the number six is, uh, so we try to locate them as close to the waterfront park and the um, um, and the multi-use trail. So uh, number six is uh, kind of more towards the top right, I guess you could say. Okay, um, and I guess along that same area there, you discussed the interface along Lower Road and Road B. Um, how are you dealing with the grade change when it abuts against the, the town home? Do they have walkouts kind of on their second story? Yeah, so the town homes that uh, face uh, this development are, are two stories. So they're essentially one story buried um, into the ground and they have sort of their garage or sort of, a, like you said, kind of like a walkout, is it, um, walkout condition on the other side. So we're using those town homes to essentially negotiate uh, no more or less one story of grade. Okay, uh, and bear with me here, I got a couple more. Um, for the daycare space, I, guess I see that you've been, you have a minim minimum requirement through I guess your land development agreement or the zoning. Um, is that, I know there are open space requirements per uh, number of, of daycare attendees. Are you kind of, are you meeting that or are you exceeding that currently with the open space proposed? So we're currently exceeding it with the open space, and uh, I think that's part of the discussion as well. Is uh, you know, uh, Bosa is looking at uh, you know different uh, different tenants to uh, different daycare tenants to occupy that space, so that daycare uh, could potentially grow. Um, so kind of building up some flexibility to have the outdoor space kind of be able to accommodate even an expanded daycare program is uh, mm -hmm. is desirable. Great. And just, you know, grading-wise, I mean, I think our, our approach for now is to, to keep it as flat as we can and then deal with the big grade change, I guess, just um, northwest of the three, of number three, and then it would it would sort of step down with, with terrace walls. So it was, we sort of set aside a, a more, a, a fairly flat space to accommodate a, a flexible program. Right, and, and so I guess the, but the interface of the park, is that, is that, does that meet the grade of the daycare space? Park is lower. Park, oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, so, so the north edge, I think that, you know, it probably ranges, um, Mark, and maybe you can just verify this, but I think that the biggest difference would be in the northeast corner, and we are there on site yesterday, and I think it's about eight feet, seven, eight feet, hmm. uh, and then as you get, um, if, if you're on the west edge of the site and you're on the multi-use path, um, the high point of that would be at the walkway that connects to the central plaza. And then as you head north, it starts to go down and it meets the, um, it meets the park grade at sort of the northwest corner of the site. 
So I guess the north edge is the difference is probably anywhere from, you know, a foot or so all the way up to, you know, say, say seven feet or so. So what we would view about as our suction showed through um, some, you know, feature boulders and more terrace planting. Gotcha. Um, from the, for the building facade, did, did you explore, I guess, the, the one part that, that sticks out to me is kind of the large gray horizontal shiplap siding. Did you explore any other potential cladding treatments for those, those areas? Yeah, we did look at sort of different orientations of cladding and kind of, you know, breaking up, uh, you know, different fields of cladding. And, you know, I think what that wasn't re really meeting the intent of kind of the architectural language, and that was to create this, you know, somewhat of a canvas with, uh, with the siding. Um, so then we could really sort of highlight the punched, uh, punched window pattern and sort of the patterning of the balconies. Uh, once you break that cladding up too much, you kind of lose the, uh, lose the idea that there's this kind of framed gable with this kind of field of siding in which, um, that it contains. Um, so it's really the windows and the balconies and kind of the soffit materials and things like that that, uh, you know, kind of give it, uh, give it the texture. Okay, and, and final question here. Uh, thank you for bearing with me on this, but did you explore uh, inside balconies as opposed to tack-on balconies? Like in some of your precedent imagery, a lot of them from Scandinavia, they, they tend to feature inside balconies. I was wondering if that was ever a, a design exploration point for you. Yeah, I think early days we did have, uh, have something like that, and, uh, you know, it's a little bit twofold. One, the balconies that extend out kind of create a little bit more impact from a you know a texture and articulation point of view uh the other thing is is it's uh, it does sort of complicate the envelope from an environmental point of view so you know we're really kind of going for a building facade that's going to perform well and uh, from an energy efficiency point of view and an air tightness point of view so all of the kind of articulation and things like that of the building facade would uh, would kind of uh, you know uh, diminish that performance to some degree this would be you know, increasing our exterior envelope. Okay, that's uh, all the questions I have, thanks. John, uh, Jonas here, could I just make a quick note um, to something that uh, Barton had, had asked about? Yes. Just wanted to be here, there was quite a bit of discussion about elevations and the side elevations. Just wanted to remind the panel members that there is pretty good elevation profiles in the ADP package. Thanks very much. Okay, um, we're going from Carlos uh, to Sarah now. There, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so my first question is, um, so I didn't look through and see what the calculation was, but what percentage of the accessible units will be rental in the B building? Mark? Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> um, so I believe the B building is uh, it's 20% if I got that right. Um, no, but I'm not, I'm not asking how many accessible units there are. Of oh. the accessible units that are being built, how many of those will be rentable? And how many will be market? Okay, um, so all of these buildings are, uh, are rental. Uh, so the only difference is, uh, is, is market rental and, uh, and, uh, and below market rental. Okay. Yeah, so the entire project is rental. So how many are below market rental of the accessible units? I don't have that number in front of me. I don't know if you have that one, Steve, by chance, or maybe you have that, uh, Susan? So 
Sorry, no, I, I don't have that uh, statistic, but I'll, uh, certainly we can follow up on that. Uh, I'll follow up by saying the same thing, that we can we can definitely follow up with, uh, with providing that statistic if it's required. I, I don't have it on hand, but we can put it together relatively quickly. Yeah, just trying to determine, you know, for the parking, whether or not, you know, what, what the demand will be, because there currently is eight spaces below. Well, four for the B building and two up top, so six. And you've got 15 accessible units and 10 adaptable in the B building and 30 adaptable in the C building. So just trying to figure that one out. Um, do you have any contingency plan if there are going to be more than six people in the B building that require accessible parking? Um, well, I suppose I, you mentioned two, two at grade. So there's four, I guess there's four at grade uh, between the two buildings, or are you just referring to building B at this point? Uh, well, just building B as it's got the majority of the accessible and adaptive right. units. So. Yeah, so currently we. You know, currently you've got six for building B, right? Yeah, that's the, uh, that's, the current count. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't say right now it's anticipated to kind of have any any more than that currently. That could definitely be a limiting factor. Um, okay, and then um, in the accessible unit, the master bedroom seems to lack a closet. I believe there's an intent for kind of a wardrobe uh, next to the master, um, but uh, you know that could certainly be. Um, it's quite a long uh, head wall where the bed uh, butts into, so there could be an opportunity to do a built-in closet there as well. That could certainly be considered during the plan development. Okay, and. Um... Um... It seems that there's pretty limited counter space in the accessible unit. Um, are, are you planning to have the, I mean, I know this is getting down to minor detail, but if it's dedicated accessible housing, I've got to ask a question. Um, is there, is it the cooktop going to be a cooktop or is it a stove with the oven below? Um, I don't think we have final specs at this point. I would imagine it would be, um, you know, a slide-in range would be my would be my guess at this point. But I don't have uh, I don't have final uh, uh, interior specs at this point for okay. the appliances. So likewise, under the sink, is it going to be wheel underable? Like, are you going to be able to wheel under the sink in the kitchen, or for that matter, in the bathroom? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, again, I think that's a consideration that we we could look at during kind of the interior design. But, uh, yeah, that's no taken. That would definitely uh, kind of make it more usable. Absolutely. And um, can you tell me about the patio? Because none of the, the size uh, requirements of, of the patios are available. Um, do you know, is there, yeah. sorry? Yeah, so I was just going to say, uh, so each of the units uh, does have a patio, and uh, the requirement is for each unit to uh, kind of hit 10% of its uh, of its unit area. And uh, so each each unit will, 
would have a would have a patio of that size of that size. And um, is there a threshold that's going to go over the patio door crack? Yeah, interesting. That's uh, you know that's a detail we're going to have to kind of struggle with uh, just from a envelope point of view and kind of sort of see how we can how we can kind of make that work. But uh, yeah, definitely point taken. That's uh, you know that's only you. Oh, I I lost you there. Um, that threshold. So you're jumping in and out in your audio. Um, and then just going to site furnishings, has there been any consideration for any of the benches to have armrests on them? Um, we can certainly consider. That one, Mike. Yeah, sure. We we um, we can we certainly can consider that. We're we're mainly um, going with what was installed in in phase one, um, just for continuity uh, from a materiality perspective, but. Um, I'm sure we could definitely, in key areas, provide, um, you know, adjustments like that. Uh, so we could definitely look into that. Uh, there is some custom uh, ones in the central plaza that we could look at at uh, RMS as well. Okay. I, I think that's all my questions right now. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, Jackie? Oh. <laughs> if you're ready. It sounds like Sarah has one more question. Sorry, I had oh. one more question. I, I just missed sorry, my notes. Sorry. Okay, no problem. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, can you just tell me what the dimensions of the elevator is going to be? Sorry, Mark. Mark. Here. Um, I don't have uh, I don't have that dimension off uh, off the top of my off the top of my head, unfortunately. But uh, uh, you know, they'll definitely be sized. Um, you know, sort of can accommodate. Um, you know, and you know, accessibility standards. I think that would be, um, you know, as part of the building code, we're required to provide accessibility to kind of the front doors of all of these units. Uh, so that includes the path of travel from the lobby up the elevators and uh, and down the hallways, um, and then and then into some of these units that are are uh, are designated as uh, as accessible. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Go ahead, Jackie. My pleasure. Um, thank you very much. So I'm, I'm really glad to see affordable housing being built in Squamish. That's excellent. Um, thank you for the presentation. Could you please uh, just uh, clarify the difference between a, um, an adaptable unit versus an accessible unit? Yeah, so essentially there's two, um, there's, uh, uh, two sets of requirements. Um, under the building code, uh, accessibility, uh, an accessible unit has more of a, uh, you know, more stringent requirements in terms of area, um, in terms of tur um, like turning circles for wheelchairs, uh, things like that. So they, they, uh, the unit plans tend to need a little bit more area to accommodate that movement. Um, the adaptability uh, standards anticipate uh, a whole range of different users. Not necessarily uh, someone in a wheelchair, but someone who maybe uses different types of mobility devices or has other types of uh, of, uh, of needs. So it's uh, it's kind of two levels, and the adaptability ones are are uh, are really meant to you know kind of you know cater to a kind of a broader uh, a broader uh, broader group per se, I guess. Um, where the accessible ones are really kind of honing in on those. You know those those larger turning radiuses that are required for you know uh, things like wheelchairs. And how many of the adaptable units are there? Uh, adaptable. I'm gonna have to go back to my stats here. So in the in the CD40 zone um, of the 55 non-market rental, uh, there's we're required 11 to be accessible. See here, and 20% 20, uh, 20 of the 50 market rental units are required to be adaptable, and uh, and we exceed uh, we exceed those numbers. And so the waterfront park is that across 
distance away from Laurelwood? So um, where Laurelwood terminates at the, uh, the cul-de-sac, uh, that's essentially the one end of, uh, of the waterfront park. So at the north edge okay. of okay. Building 3C is where Waterfront Park is. Okay. Sorry. I thought there might have been a, a crosswalk issue, but now I understand where it is. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. The parking deficiency, what is the shared parking covenant? What, that might be a question for staff, but what exactly is a shared parking covenant? Um, Susan here. Um, the, the zoning bylaw has a provision in it that if a uh, engineer submits a parking study indicating that the peak period of parking or different uses occur at different times, then the district will consider the district is able to reduce the parking. And uh, the parking study that we submitted, and sorry, I don't know where the feedback's coming from. I hope that's not me. Um, the parking study that's been submitted that we are still actually just reviewing indicates that the um, visitor parking and the commercial parking occurs at different times, and so it would be a candidate for the shared parking provision that's in the zoning bylaw. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the, the central plaza area, um, I'm glad to see that there's a performance space. Who will be sort of programming the space, who, uh, if, if um, residents want to program the space themselves, will they have to go through the district? Will there be a strata? How will that be um, run? Um, Brendan uh, or Mark, you guys want to take that one? Yeah, I guess, uh, an interesting one. I don't think I have the you know, the whole answer for that because it is a it is on strata land. But I believe uh, either Brandon or Susan, maybe there is there is a covenant that's sort of a right of public use for uh, for a lot of these public trails. Is there not? Okay, so if someone wanted, you know, say two different groups wanted to perform on that stage and it just happened to be on, they wanted it on the same day, is that the strata who decides it? Is, is that going to be run out of the strata? I think the idea there from the developer's perspective, uh, you know, they would have their property management group that's kind of running this uh, strata and uh, so they would essentially curate what you know, what events kind of happen in that space. And uh, obviously it's probably to the benefit of the retail units to kind of have those types of events happen because that'll uh, sort of bring, uh, exactly. bring customers to the area. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Sorry, I was just going to add on to what Mark was saying. And I think, you know, we could, like Mark said, you know, we're going to have our property manager um, look at, take care of that. And we would, we, we would look at, potential programming similar to kind of an amenity space or a party room, right? And I think if, if different residents or different people were um, interested in booking it, we uh, we would just develop a system where they could contact um, the, the manager and we could look at hosting events there. Great. And in terms of public art in that space, um, would you consider, uh, con have you, do you have your own artists already lined up or would you consider consulting with the Squamish Arts Council to develop uh, public art in that space. Um, you might answer it. Or Mike. Okay. Well, I was just going to say we're just we're showing as a as a potential amenity, you know, to contribute to that placemaking as a you know as a potential location, but. Um, 
in terms of uh, who both the hires or works with, I'm not sure. Maybe Brendan, you can uh, speak to that. Sure, I, I can touch base on that, and I um, I'll go back to Susan. But I think, uh, and I'll confirm this with Susan as well. I don't believe that there's a public art requirement for this site, Susan. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, that wasn't included in the design guidelines for waterfront landing. I think it is in the design guidelines for other parts of the district. Oh, no, I didn't say it was a requirement. I was just asking if, if you were considering it, and if you were considering it, would you consider talking to the Squamish Art Council about how to, how to uh, implement it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think we're more than happy to have that, uh, to have that come to have that conversation and um, it's something that we can follow up on um, after the meeting and uh, engage with them to see if there's any um, way we can assist or, or if they're interested in the space. Okay, and just one more, one last final question. Uh, in terms of the daycare, uh, is that going to be a public daycare and does the district run it or will that be a privately operated daycare uh, rented by a private daycare operation? So the developer decides whether it's a private or a public? Yes. Okay, thank you. That's all. Okay, thanks. Thanks, thanks Jackie. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, David. With us, David? No, he's not there. How about Graham? Oh. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Hi, thanks. Uh, so just picking up on Jackie's question about the parking covenant. Um, so I just, if I just heard from staff, um, the ability to do this does exist in the zoning and development bylaw and subject to review of the parking study that this is an acceptable uh, approach for the variance. Is that correct? Hey, yeah, sorry, Susan here. I keep turning my sound off. Um, Yes, that's correct, and we're still just reviewing it. Um, there's a couple of different um, ideas are presented in the parking study. The one idea is that this uh, shared parking arrangement could be pursued, and the second thing that is presented in the parking study is potentially reducing the uh, parking standard for for the uh, rental housing, which is uh, something that's been done in other communities and occasionally has also been done in in the District of Squamish. So we're still just reviewing that study uh, at this point. Okay, great. That speaks to my second question because I think I saw in the presentation that there is a rationale for the reduced parking uh, because of affordability. So it sounds like the district is still working on this, but I'm wondering if the developer has any uh, definition of what we mean by affordability here. So to the applicant, just understanding height. Um, so 
context, so it looks like the adjacent phases three and two, those are mainly townhouses, and then um, I think it's phase four, closer to the water, those, those are the only other buildings that are about, are they about six stories over there? Yeah, so there is the ability on the apartment sites to go up to uh, up to six stories on those uh, on those particular lots. Okay, um, so just to the site specific height, just looking at your elevation sheets three twelve, three eleven, and three twelve. Um, to just make sure I'm I'm reading this uh, correct, I'm not the architect here, but um, staff report says the variance is twenty six point one, which. Um, I think is measured from existing grade because you're drawing say 102, which is about 31 meters, and I'm guessing that's from from geodetic. Is that correct? Yeah, I think you've got that correct, and we're measuring yeah. that to kind of the midpoint of the uh, of the uh, of the roof slope. Yeah, great. That was my that was my next question. I see it's to the midpoint. Why not the top of the the gable ridge? Uh, I believe in the bylaw it speaks to uh, because we have such a strong kind of sloping gable form. Uh, you know, the building is kind of a mix of, you know, flat roof in the middle, but sort of gables uh, kind of on the side. So we sort of took the more restrictive, I guess, sort of uh, height calculation and, and used, the, uh, used the midpoint of the gable. Because from an elevational point of view, it, it's essentially perceived as a, uh, as a gable pitched roof. Right. And sorry, you said that, that is the bylaw requirement for measuring height? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, cause yeah, I was wondering about the parapet looking at elevation 312 so that it's, it's an architectural feature. It, it comes up, but there's no, no function except maybe screening some of the mechanical on the roof. Yeah. And it's to give the, um, you know, give the building that kind of architectural language that uh, we're looking for to tie in with the, with the adjacent phases. Right. Okay. Uh, and just switching to material. So, um, some of the fiber cement uh, panels, um, there's, there's quite a bit of it. I'm just wondering if along those CRUs, uh, along that band where the signage is, whether you consider using any other materials or introducing small bits of material like timber or wood. Yeah, I think, I think the idea there, because the, um, I think with a lot of these retail units, you know, ultimately they start to get occupied by the, uh, you know, the renter's signage and things like that. So they sort of naturally take on sort of life and articulation just through the retail activity uh, that happens. And then at grade, you know, the, uh, the retail storefronts are more or less, uh, uh, you know, more or less window walls. So um, there's sort of a lot of transparency and obviously sort of visibility to what's happening within the retail suite itself. So um, yeah, that, that panel language, uh, you know, continues the, you know, the pattern of what's happening on the roof and kind of acts as a bit of a backdrop or a canvas for the signage that's going to be applied to it. But okay. uh, I think there could be an opportunity to look at reveal patterns potentially to, you know, you know, consider sort of how we, how we create a different texture or something on that base. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, just quickly, last question. Um, heard a bit about sustainability, step code three, and, and a few other things that may happen. Can you just expand on a little bit or refresh what, what your plan is for sustainability? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we're going to be hitting the uh, step code three targets. Um, so really sort of hitting the, uh, you know, the wall, uh, the wall values, the U values for the windows, you know, the mechanical systems in terms of you know, HRVs and the units to kind of, uh, you know, have the buildings, uh, you know, perform well. There's no gas in this building. We're going to be using electric, uh, electric heat and appliances. Um, and then just from an air tightness point of view, following kind of the best practices in terms of the building envelope. Um, so, yeah, following kind of the, you know, the model that's more or less laid out from a, uh, uh, you know, from the step code itself. Okay, great, thanks. That's all my questions. Thanks, Grant. Uh, David now. Over to you, David. Can you hear us? Looks like your mic is off. Can you hear me now? There we go, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, 
Yeah, I just wanted to uh, ask a couple of questions about so the DPA 13 guidelines to enhance the connection to the surrounding views. Have you done any views from the highway or any shadow studies? Um, so looking at the uh, looking at the shadows, we're you know we're we're somewhat of a north south orientation. So from uh, from a shadow perspective, we're actually kind of working out quite well because we're somewhat presenting the skinny end of the buildings to kind of more or less you know, more or less the southern edge. Um, you know, and the setbacks from the um, you know the adjacent residential developments are are quite quite vast so uh, we don't really have uh, much risk of kind of shadowing adjacent uh, adjacent neighbors and then from uh, you know from the central plaza point of view we kind of looked at hey, are we going to get you know sort of a good amount of sun into that uh, that plaza space so you know probably that plaza is you know using being used more in the early morning for that coffee or kind of later in the day for the kind of the late afternoon evening uh, patio spill out space and uh, so that patio is sort of capturing or that central plaza is capturing that kind of western uh, western sun as it comes around so um, yeah we're, we're able to sort of capture a good amount of sunlight for the uh, central plaza and the uh, and the pocket park and the outdoor play uh, uh, off of the daycare okay and then the views from the highway it was, you know this is a perfect view into downtown to see Squamish for the first time as you're coming down this hill. Uh, any views from the highway or any consideration for protecting, enhancing that view? Yeah, I think it, it, it'll be definitely uh, visible from uh, from the highway. Uh, just to the south of us are the townhomes, so you you get kind of this view across the top of the you know the townhome development. Uh, before you kind of see the you know the higher uh, the higher buildings, so we do capture that kind of view to downtown as you kind of you know come down the slope off the highway, I guess. Okay. Um, and then just going to the point that was talked about earlier, you know, the parapet roofs are essentially kind of a decoration, and your section A three point one four sort of shows the heel. You know, artificially higher than the roof. Is there, is there no latitude to sort of just bring that down to at least beat the height restrictions, considering it is quite a tall building already? Yeah, we can certainly, you know, we could look at if there's any adjustments in the heel heights to kind of um, mitigate that. I think the slope was quite, uh, quite critical though. Uh, if the slope of the or the pitch of the roof came down um, too much, it it began to look too flat. Uh, but maybe an area we could look at is if, uh, you know, once we kind of look at it uh, more structural, from a structural perspective, maybe there's some room in the truss heel height that we could drop that down a little bit more to, to mitigate the height. Okay. Um, and then parking, um, recognize the traffic study. Is there any, been any investigation to sort of actual car share spaces, such as Modo or, you know, especially for lower income or, you know, people that may not have a car? Yeah, so in the in the uh, land use agreement, if I've got my number correctly, we're, uh, we can incorporate one car share unit for every 50 units. Uh, so I think that is, that is an intent to kind of explore, uh, you know, car share. I think, I think right now in the district, that's, um, you know, the car shares aren't quite quite there, so I'm not sure if that's, uh, this might be a question more for Brendan and Jonas, uh, uh, Jonas but uh, uh, there is per, um, provisions in the LDA to have one car share for every 50 units. Okay. And then a little bit of detail here, but how are you policing this uh, traffic study where you're going to have up to 14 visitor spaces in commercial spaces? You know, what if you know, what if everyone leaves their car and stays two nights, then commercial spaces are, you know, how are you going to police that? Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely partly a management issue, and, uh, but I guess also part of the shared use study is, is uh, you know, the timing is uh, a little bit different where, you know, the commercial uses are probably more from a, you know, an 8 to 6 p.m., you know, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., and the visitor from a residential point of view is uh, 
before kind of late evening, maybe overnight. Uh, but in terms of making sure people are ushered along in the morning and not occupying those spaces for multiple days, um, will you know probably come out of parking bylaws and uh, and just management of the site. Okay, and, and then and signage, I guess. Yeah. Um, my last point, it was it was raised by Graham, but I kind of want to just raise it again just to probe a little bit deeper. But the material around the commercial that you listed that that's going to be hardy as well. That's right. Okay, and I guess I'll just ask it. There was just no other investigation into higher quality materials down there, and just I don't personally regard hardy as a high quality material, so to see an entire building including the retail, it just, um, yeah. Yeah, it does, I guess it comes down to the detailing a bit. Um, you know, we did talk about, well, out of the, on the concrete, um, you know, because the first floor is going to be kind of concrete uh, with wood frame above, do we, you know, I always hesitate to go the painted concrete uh, approach because guaranteed after uh, after a couple of years, you're just looking at peeling paint off of concrete. It's, uh, it never seems to stand up very well, um, uh, but there are there are other kind of panelized products we could look at. Some are, um, you know, slightly better quality uh, than than Hardy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I guess products like Aquatone and and uh, you know those types of panel product uh, products come to mind. So I think there there still could be some exploration there, definitely. Okay. Uh, Again, it's. It's balancing budgets, as you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's all my questions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, David. Um, I'll start with the, just a couple of questions. I just want to address the um, green space outside the daycare a little bit. Um, understanding that um, the space that is dedicated to the daycare will be, need to be dedicated to the daycare. Uh, will need to be fenced um, so that it's private and secure. This is this is a requirement of the province for daycares. Um, I just want to be sure that you're you plan for that. You understand that that is that is part of the design that will need to occur there. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if you had a look at um, a bit of a better awning uh, over some of that green space. So given that we have so many rainy days. And they like to have the kids going outside for recess and other things. It's, um, it's nice to have um, a, a space that's not wet, and the awning actually acts as a, a very good barrier for sound for the um, units above. I'm just curious if you had uh, have any idea on how that could be achieved there. I guess I can save it for for a suggestion, but you know, as a question, I could say, is, are these considerations that you've you've uh, taken in previously? Yeah, and I think uh, I think part of the I guess to answer your first uh, first question, yeah, that there is going to have to be a sort of a defined enclosed uh, outdoor play for the province, uh, and uh, you know, part of part of not defining this just yet is the you know, there's a minimum size of daycare that we're required, uh, but there could actually be a larger daycare that goes in here. So that kind of targeted moving a bit right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether there's an opportunity within that outdoor play, uh, play space to have some sort of, uh, uh, you know, covered structure that's maybe part of the, uh, the outdoor play to provide part of the uh, required covered outdoor space uh, requirement for daycares. Uh, I think that's uh, you know, something that we will have to look at as part of the development of this uh, of this park space. Yeah, yeah, but it, for... yeah, definitely on our radar. Okay, okay, wonderful. Obviously, structural implications there and whatnot, but um, so long as you're thinking ahead, uh, my bet is that you'll need 5,000 square feet for the daycare of interior space and at least 2,500 outside. So, um, yeah, it's usually about 50% for the outdoor. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there, do you have a sort of a protocol in mind for the drop, drop off of, of um, children in the morning and where, where the vehicles would go and stop for a few minutes and safety around that and, and uh, 
um, you know, not only safety as far as vehicles, but also as far as the distance that the child would have to go from the vehicle to the, to the door of the school or to where. Yeah. Yeah. So the parking stall is kind of adjacent to, uh, number three, uh, which is, uh, on this plan, which is the outdoor kind of play area and park. Mm -hmm. Um, five of those stalls would be dedicated for just daycare drop off. And uh, so we've kind of positioned those as close as possible to the actual, um, you know, daycare, daycare entry. And they're, you know, when you get out of the car, you're directly onto, uh, onto a sidewalk and, you know, access to the front door. So you're not having to cross over any drive aisles or anything like that. Yeah. So let's say as a part of the parking programming that, uh, that David brought up as well, then you would have something like a, a five minutes stopping only during the period between 8 and 9 a.m. or something like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I see. Yeah, and that looks like a good spot as far as getting closely in there. Um, this parking study, is this available for us? Uh, yes, I believe Susan mentioned it. I think, Susan, you said it's attached to the staff report as a link, I believe. Uh, I Listen here, no, we didn't attach it to the staff report. We're still reviewing it internally, and I expect we're going to have some comments back to you and uh, look for it to be resubmitted. So okay. at this point, um, I, I didn't attach it for that reason. I think we're, we're still looking at it. Okay, very good. Thanks. Is there a way, Susan, that we could understand where that can be accessed once it's finalized? Uh, yes, I can um, just send it directly to the ADP members and um, uh, just on the question of additional information, um, I realize uh, back to an earlier comment that most of the slides today don't uh, really indicate the design of the phase one and two units, so I'll um, also provide some of that additional information. Okay, wonderful. Thanks very much. That's, uh, that's all the questions uh, from me. Um, my other ones were uh, mostly covered by Carlos, which was great. Um, so anyone else with any other questions before we go to comments? Farzan? Hi, uh, yes. Uh, uh, Yonis mentioned that there's a set of drawings. Uh, I tried to look for it, architectural drawings. Usually attached to the email that we received from Venice. I don't know if you guys received it. I didn't. And I tried to look for it. I couldn't find the landscape drawing or architecture drawing. It's, so there is a I, link to a Dropbox. Uh, yeah, I tried to link. find it. I couldn't find it. But anyway, doesn't yeah. matter. I, it actually took me a couple tries before I recognized the, the routing to get to that. So um, it was a little bit tricky, I'll admit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll just jump in here for then, uh, Susan, again. Um, yeah, this may have been handled a bit differently than some other reports, but if you go in the staff report, there is a list of attachments, and then one of those uh, attachments listed is the link to Dropbox, so it's actually in the body of the report. Okay, uh, I'll try to, to look for it later, but uh, usually it comes with the, so with the email that you see. There is a link that I can easily go and see the joint, I couldn't find it, but that's okay. Any other questions? No, then we'll uh, go to comments and uh, we'll start with Christina. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Thanks again for a, a good presentation. Um, I think the project um, sounds really nice and uh, I think it, the mix of, of rental housing is uh, uh, much needed. Um, so just to speak to the landscape primarily, um, I think there's a nice nice mix of usable outdoor spaces. Um, the connecting trail is a great site feature throughout the entire project and uh, it's great that it connects this, these two phases as well. Um, and I really like how the parking lot is, is broken up with, uh, with a lot of planting and um, shade an opportunity for rain gardens um, as a bit of a feature as well. Um, I think it's a really good idea to integrate the rain garden and encourage that wherever possible. Um, and I think it's very versatile to use the natural rock 
for the to take up the grade in the various locations where you need to. I think that um, simply because it's versatile, it speaks to the um, to the location, um, and it, and it helps to keep it feeling a little more natural, especially when you're dealing with such large buildings, which maybe are not so typical for Squamish. Um, this might be a question, I'm not sure, but um, just speaking to the playground again, sort of echoing what, what John said about their, you know, having some kind of a outside covered area, I'm also wondering um, if that entire space needs to be utilized for the daycare, then um, there really isn't, because it has to be fenced and, and other children would not be allowed to use it during, during the daycare time. So I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity for, or maybe from, a different location because I don't have a great sense of the context um, to maybe other phases where there might be a playground um, that's you, that, that children could use um, that live in these buildings but they aren't in the daycare. Um, so if there is one, maybe, um, you know, hopefully that's connected closely to this development where the kids don't have to cross a road potentially, they can use the uh, internal pedestrian system to get to it. Um, I appreciate the mix of planting. I think I might have already said that, but um, with all the shade trees and the indigenous planting and the concept of utilizing some of the more flashy planting at decision nodes and entrances, um, it's always a really nice way to bring attention to certain areas, downplay others. Um, I also really appreciate that internal space um, and having it as a bit of a flex area where you could have gatherings and you could have concerts. Um, the one thing I'm just, you know, sort of playing around in my mind is whether or not that could be, instead of a hard service surface, maybe a grassed area or something like that. Because when it's not being utilized, I'm just thinking, you know, for rainy days on end, for example, there really wouldn't be a lot of people in there. Um, and if it's not being used by people, maybe it could, it could at least be, you know, <laughs> a bit of a rain catchment area, stormwater management area. Um, so that's a consideration potentially. Overall, I think it has a really nice flow and it's well thought out and um, I think it looks great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Christina. Uh, we'll go to Farzin now. Hi, thank you very much. I, very briefly, because it's very late, um, I have a little to concern with the massing of the building itself, especially the height from the street. I think it's relatively, as David also mentioned, relative to the height because of the FCL uh, and the size and height of the building is relatively massive building. And I was hoping, I, I, I understand about the budget and this is a affordable project, I was hoping for a better quality materials for the finish. Uh, that's all. Thanks, President. And Carlos is next. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll speak first to the, the parking variance. If one is required, uh, depending on the outcome of this traffic report, I would highly support or strongly support that parking variant. I think it makes a lot of sense to have sites like this share commercial and residential visitor parking. And um, particularly where we're not applying downtown parking standards because the parking standards associated with this development are much higher in downtown. So I think that's important to recognize. There's also quite a bit of commercial space in this building uh, and it's coming on fairly early in this development. So um, I think everyone that knows commercial knows there are challenges with that. Uh, and so I commend you for, for doing that. I know it's part of the zoning, but still there's a lot of CRUs in this plan. Um, but having said that, I really, really strongly encourage you to find a way to expand that daycare space if possible because a uh, green space or an open space of that size is a really tough thing to fit into a new development. And so I think if you can maximize that, um, that'd be highly commendable. And I don't know if there's a district incentive that can be applied to that, 
uh, to make that happen. But if there is, I think it should because, you know, we had a report to council a few weeks ago about daycare, it's really important. Uh, and this is a great opportunity to integrate that into a, into a development site. Um, I asked a question about the 70 meter squared requirement for affordable housing units. I really, I understand the, the council's position at the time, but new, new, uh, like there's affordable housing under the bylaw and then there's like truly affordable housing. Uh, and one of the biggest contributors to that is unit size. Uh, and new construction is always going to be more expensive than older construction. So it's, it's not, it's a difficult equation to work out. I think every municipality is dealing with it differently, but, um, looking for some, if there was flexibility to provide smaller units, I think that, that would be a good thing. However, this developer has come forward and decided that a whole building is going to be rental, which helps, I think, overall uh, pricing, unit pricing in the town, because when it comes online, there'll be a, a good supply of rental housing, which we need. So I think that also should be recognized um, when, when looking at this application. Um, I have some concerns with the aesthetic of the building. Just, I, we, you know, everyone presents these awesome looking Scandinavian buildings that I love. And then we get buildings with like two different types of hardy panels. Uh, and, and I don't, you know, some of that can be influenced by, I think there's probably a hesitation. Like if you look at, I think you had one, one of your present imageries, uh, is this great project. I think it's a, a Finnish, yeah, Finland's first high rise wooden apartment building. It's pre, you know, prefab. Prefab, cross laminated timber, got real wood on the exterior and a bunch of different cladding. Uh, it's a great looking building. I would love for you to take, uh, to more literally take some of that design influence and apply that to a building like this and, and look at some richer materials. I, I know we always complain about maintenance when it comes to mid-rise buildings and wood, but um, I really think that there are some opportunities, or we should take the opportunity to highlight this natural material in our town. So, uh, if nothing else, I've got concerns, or big concerns about having five stories of horizontal gray shiplap. I think we've seen that in some other rental buildings in town, and it doesn't look great. So, I would really recommend you look at an alternative uh, material treatment for that. And I recognize that the balconies and the um, punched windows provide some articulation, but I don't think it's enough to, to break up that that mass of gray. Um, that is about it. Overall, I, you know, I think it's going to be a great addition. It's going to provide much needed housing to our community. Uh, and the elements that it's incorporated are, are quite clever. So um, that's my comment. Thanks so much. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, Sarah is next. Okay. So oh, let me get to you. Recommendations. Here we are. Um, so I looked through the um, which of the what the percentage of the accessible units would be non-market, and it's actually all of the accessible units are non-market rental. Um, so that could provide you with maybe fewer vehicles potentially. Um, having said that, I still um, think that it's going to be insufficient, the amount of accessible parking that you have relative to the number of accessible units and slash adaptable units that you've got. Um, these are bigger vehicles that have often side lifts and they require the space to get in and out of the vehicle, so it, it is something that uh, should, be, should be considered. Um, also, um, da, 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 da. Um, with the CRUs, this, this is another one to do with parking. If you've got restaurants that are going to be open into the evening, then how can they possibly be shared spaces? It's just another food for thought, I guess. Um, I'd like to recommend that there's color changes um, at the level changes in the ramp. So, you know, it can just be the same as you've done with the 
the entrances to all of the doors. You've changed the, the color tone from a light gray to a dark gray. If you could just do that with the landings, that's a good indicator for people with visual impairment. Um, you need to have tactile indicators at the top of your stairs. So that doesn't necessarily need to be the, you know, yellow twizzies, but certainly there should be some, um, you know, lines put in when the cement is laid. Um, you need to have handrails on both sides of your stairs. Um, the benches, I'd recommend that you review them as to where the locations are and not all of the benches, but um, to some of the benches add some um, armrests. Uh, in particular, I would think that those in the plaza area with the round planter in the middle, if you could add one or two armrests on those because there is a backrest to that bench that that would help. Somebody's got their getting feedback. Okay. Um, and then with the accessible unit, the master bedroom will have a built-in with a lower option a hanging bar. Um, additionally, the adaptable unit. Uh, B C one the door is the door on the left on the left. And um and I would just I would just see building code now for now sixty percent of the CFA standards. You follow the version of the recommendations for the interior requirements for the kitchen, and um, that the washer dryer vents that are going to be in the are going to be in the need to be a front load, and consideration to be given to your appliances for controls at the front, control at the front. Um, um, so that you're not reaching across. So um, um, additionally, because, additionally of the because of the lack of coverage in the accessible unit, accessible unit you should look at having look at having uh, pull out work uh, pull out work um, um, you know, potentially go between Maybe above the dishwasher, or between or the between the so so that you've got an so addition, you've got an addition, um, and, um, and also and also that because these are going to be rented, they're going to be rented. I would suggest that all get all of um washroom washroom uh, wheeling uh, shower. wheeling shower. Uh, you know uh, you know the bench, bench. bench. Not necessarily somebody not necessarily somebody can provide a bench. Provide a bench.
recommend that there's armrests on the benches that have a backrest on them. So I think that that's almost exclusively the round planter seating that exists. So if there can be some armrests on those, and unless there's benches with backrests elsewhere, you know, that may be sufficient. And go back to the beginning. Hang on. The tactile indicators, benches. So with the accessible units, all of the accessible units should have a built-in closet that has, you know, a couple of heights of bars to hang things on. Additionally, there needs to be some special consideration for all of the appliances that are going to go into the unit to have the operating controls at the front of the unit, and there should be front-load washer-dryers. And additionally, because of the lack of counter space, please add a pull-out shelf kind of workspace that would come out, you know, between the sink and the fridge or the sink and the stove, or even, you know, potentially, I guess, above the dishwasher, so there's an additional workspace to work off of. I would also encourage you with the accessible unit is to have the tow kick attached to the doors beneath the sink in both the bathroom and in the kitchen so that you can wheel under those sinks. And that there needs to be sufficient space on the patio to allow for somebody to get out there and open up the door. I think the dimensions in the CSA B651, it's 1725 by 1295 millimeters. So make sure that that occurs. And I would just, again, because the code refers to about 60% of B651, is that you guys actually default to the entirety of the B651 for the kitchen and bathroom standards. Those typically are a bit more in-depth than what the code currently requires. And I think that that's it. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sarah. Jackie, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Just quickly, Farzan, if you want to check the chat room, I put the direct link to the architectural drawings there. You can just click on it. My comments are just to echo both Carlos and Farzan that a better grade of product be used on the exterior and also the gray shiplap strictly on the almost fully affordable housing be reconsidered. It's very gray and our climate can be, for a good chunk of the year, gray skies and rain. And I think it would add to the aesthetic and the architectural beauty if a different color and a better grade of product was used. And I encourage the architects and the developer to talk to the Arts Council to develop that space, the common space, not just from public art but also from performing arts. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jackie. Graham. Yeah, thanks. I'll be quick. Just echoing some of the comments about materials. I support the height variance, but I think just the apparent massing. 
uh, it, you know, the use of gray and the ship lab materials, it, it, the parent massing is quite a large building. So if there's opportunity to introduce other sort of materials or coloring while respecting the, the budget of the project, um, then I hope that can be accomplished. Uh, and as mentioned along the CRUs, if there's opportunity to introduce uh, timber or wood or local materials along that edge, um, I think would add a lot to the, the project. Um, parking variances I support. I think we need to get creative with how we approach parking and I see these, this as two potential solutions. So support that as well. Um, and otherwise just excited to see a rental project um, come on stream and especially one with uh, an affordability component. So I'll keep it at that, thanks. Thanks, Graham. And we'll go to David. Hey, yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, very, supportive of, very supportive of the rental housing, obviously, and really quite like the aesthetic of the mountain top roofs and the offset roofs. I think that works very well. Um, supportive of the parking, although I would encourage the applicant to really dig into that car share, especially if the, the project is deficient and um, taking in account, into account the end user. Uh, highly supportive of the daycare and I appreciate the play area being sort of away from the highway side. Um, I don't personally support the high variance. Um, I have a problem when they're not 100% needed, as it doesn't seem like it's needed here. Um, and especially as this project sort of, it has the potential to block views and connections, uh, which is sort of outlaid in DPA 13. And, um, and in my view, it's sort of disproportionately higher than any of the adjacent uses, so to try and keep it to that max would be an advantage. Um, I'll reiterate it again, as my other committee members have sort of said, is, you know, with this material materiality, um, this is really, a, this is the gateway building into Squamish, it's the first building you're going to see. And um, I appreciate developers want to keep costs down, but this is a massive development, so I'm hoping that there's some room in budget to go for a higher quality material, um, one that will age well as well, and especially in the commercial spaces where it's going to be tactile and you want some sort of presence. Um, and lastly, I, I, I mean, I don't personally think the tandem parking will work, especially as it's been assigned to all the two and three bedroom units. Um, it's reasonable to assume that most of these users will both work or if there are three people in there working and they'll all need access to cars. So um, I'll leave that up to the, the, the district to, to decide on. But otherwise, yeah, great to see so much rental. Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, that's from my part on the commercial side. I think this is one of the best commercial designs I've seen in a long time. Um, I just want to congratulate you guys on your focus there. Um, I mean, functionally, it, 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 it will work great. Um, it's part of the reason why I would support the height variance because uh, you've, you've actually given uh, proper height inside the commercial units of 18 feet, which is fantastic. Um, I'll suggest the shelter for the, the daycare as something uh, seriously to look at now because You'll, you'll, you'll have to uh, address it later on anyway, so structurally and whatnot, it would be great to see that come into the project. Um, and of course, uh, right now you show a 2,800 square foot daycare space, but I'm pretty sure you can join the other CR, CRUs onto that and, and uh, grow it as much as need be, probably up to 5,000. Um, the parking, um, once again, I think you've, you've given great focus on maintaining the parking so that the commercial space is viable, um, which is really the way to go. Um, although there have definitely come up some difficulties through our conversation here, and I think uh, mostly through programming, um, you could likely eke out another 10 spots on that uh, exterior parking area. I was just having a look at it and, uh, and not lose too many uh, trees or green space there. I think there's there's definitely opportunity there. Um, the lay-by area down at the front is really a functionally um, great 
addition there. I just suggest that that is screened um, aesthetically very nicely because those can look very awkward if uh, uh, if they're not if they're not screened well with landscaping. And then uh, my last comment is to support uh, what everyone else is saying about better materials. Um, it would be nice. Um, so that's it. Is there any other comments from anyone before we uh, sign off? Comments? Okay. So I will go to the recommendations uh, and I'll read through them once, uh, as I do. Um, recommendation A is that the advisory design panel supports the project as presented and does not need to see this project return for further review. Recommendation B is that the advisory design panel supports the project as presented and will like the applicant to work with staff to resolve the following recommendations. Item, uh, recommendation C is that the advisory design panel supports the project as presented and would like the applicant to resolve the following recommendations and return to present the revised project to ADP. And D is that the advisory design panel does not support the project as presented for the following reasons. Any discussion on which recommendations? John, John, yeah, John, yes. according to uh, the piece that we were sent, uh, item C was not an option because this is rental housing. It was yeah, in correct, red, correct. red. So, but I just wondered why it was not. I'm just reading the list of four items, so it's a, it's a good thing that you've, you've brought that up. So we won't be going for C in this case. Probably B would, uh, would be what I would suggest. Anyone else? I would say B. Okay, so um, so we'll have someone move for B in particular. Carson? Jackie to second. And anyone against? One against, so it carries item B. And now do we want to talk about any specific um, comments that are above the rest? Certainly materials, improving materials would probably at the top of the list from what it sounds like from everyone. A little more work on parking. I think it's important to be maybe able to, as David mentioned, we can work it out and not as, as high as possible. It's, I think it can be worked out. Sorry, what was that, President? The height. The height, I think it, it can be managed. To do, as, as David mentioned, too, I think mm -hmm. we should be able to have something not to exceed the maximum height. Well, we might need to agree to, to have a conflict uh, within the panel on that because I think I don't think I don't think that was unanimous. There was different comments about yeah. height. Some people were comfortable, yeah. some people weren't. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I guess John, on your comment on, on parking, like I wouldn't I don't particularly want to see more parking on that site if if it was a if it was a between with the landscape as it is now and additional parking spaces, I think that they have sufficient parking. Uh, they surely blow anything downtown out of the water when it comes to the amount of parking, even with the variance requested. I, I, totally, I, agree. I totally agree. Yeah, I agree with you there, but I'm, I'm taking to heart Sarah's comment that uh, if we could eke out a few more uh, accessible stalls on that uh, possibly, and there's an opportunity on that exterior space. Um, and also, you know, there was a comment about the shared use and whether or not that really works particularly if you've got a CRU that's open till 8 or 10 or 11 p.m. So there's, there, are, yeah, there is I, some parking that needs work. That's all. I, I, but I guess, like, you know, if you look at Laurel Wood Road, there's eight parking spaces there that are considered off-site. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there's on-street on -street parking kind of in a surrounding development. Um, yeah. if, if this development is not the same as downtown when it comes to parking. I agree with you on that. I agree with you. Fair enough. but. But accessible parking, I think, needs to be bumped up. Yeah, so I think it would be supportable to, to increase the accessible parking uh, at, like, in a reduction of what is there now, so that if they come back with two or three less parking spaces than they have currently because they've widened parking spaces to be accessible, I think that's fully supportable. That's, um, I'll take that as your opinion. I'll, I'll, I'll go the other direction on that, so maybe we'll break even in the middle. <laughs> or hear from anyone else. <laughs> uh, my okay. Are they? Uh, 
there just needs to be some extra attention spent on the accessible units to ensure that they are as accessible as possible. It can't just be like you've got the space requirements, they actually need to be functional for somebody who's in a wheelchair. So they just need to spend a little bit more time in the detail there. Yeah, I agree that that can be um, up near the top of the list for sure. Anything else screaming out at us is a main concern? I no? Just, could, I would agree with Carlos that if it comes back with a couple less spots because they've been able to accommodate the extra accessible um, stalls, then I think that's acceptable. And then the tandem spots, can be that can be worked out by management by, with the commercial units as far as times, et cetera. Yeah, I'll be curious to see that in the parking study. Absolutely. Okay, so that's it for, for, this, uh, for this project. Um, anything else anyone wants to discuss before we sign off and terminate? Nothing coming up? Okay, so can I have someone to uh, move for termination of the meeting? Sarah. Second. David. Okay, thanks very much. Anyone against? No one against. Have a wonderful day, everyone.